Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be joined together with you and to, to share in encourage, encouragement from God's Word this morning uh, and to share in praise and, and honor to our Father and to remember His Son and uh, the, the wonderful work which has been accomplished in Him and continues to be accomplished in Him and in whom we have our hope and our salvation. And um, I thought perhaps today we could uh, consider the, um, the account in Luke chapter 5, if we can go ahead and turn there. Uh, regarding the calling of Matthew, and uh, the thank you, uh, Brother John, for choosing those two hymns that led up to the exhortation this morning. Those are perfectly fit, including uh, verse verse two of the last hymn that we just sung, uh, in the example of Matthew rising up and following Christ without a word. Um, and we're going to consider that in detail uh, today, and hopefully um, gain some helpful lessons and and things that will occur in just in our walk together. Uh, so, um, looking at uh, the calling of Matthew. This is um, a really um, interesting section because very, very little technically happens in, in specifically regarding him. But this this particular event of his calling spurs off a massive theme throughout throughout the Gospels, and particularly the book, the, the Gospel of Luke, which we'll see um, regarding dealing with uh, sinners or or publicans. And and the contesting of, of Pharisees against them, and what Christ's response is every time this comes up. This is actually the seedbed for all of that when we when we look at the Gospels and we look at how Christ addresses these issues as they come up. And so we'll take a look at that. But what we'd like to do first is go back just a little bit in Luke chapter five um, and and look at verse eighteen because uh, the events that immediately lead up to um, to the calling of Matthew is. Um, uh, seems to be directly correlated to it, and, and we have some really nice, uh, helpful kind of hints there as to where where Christ's mind is and where he's going as, as he goes to call Matthew. Uh, and, and in Luke, it, it says in verse 27 that it's Levi, uh, the son of Alphaeus, but uh, we're told elsewhere that you know, Matthew was a publican, and it seems highly likely that this is the, exactly the same disciple. Uh, so if we can turn to Luke chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 18, and here we read, uh, it says, and behold, uh, in, in Christ is in Capernaum at this time, just to point that out. It says, and behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with the palsy, and they sought means, uh, sorry, actually, um, verse 17 for, for context a little bit there. Sorry about that. It came to pass on a certain day, as Jesus was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men which brought in a bed, a man which was taken with the palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in, because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. So we have this uh, rambunctious scene where uh, Christ is complete. He's in a house and he's completely surrounded, and these these men and and uh, and this man and his friends are desperately trying to get into this house to be uh, near the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking healing for their friend, having faith that he could heal them, and they wanted to go in and, and seek the physician, and yet they were kept out, and so they find some other way. They they they're able to go up on the house top, make a way to 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 dig in through the rooftop. And, uh, and actually let the man down. But it's interesting, Christ's response here. Um, he simply he, he responds to all these actions by these men and going through this process of, of letting in this man from the roof. And he says, man, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, imagine if Christ only stopped right there. I don't think that this was what these men were thinking Christ would do. This was not the expectation. They expected, likely, that Christ would allow the man to walk again. He would heal him. Like this is this is what they're looking for, right? For, for the man to 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 be healed and and to be able to walk, and and that's why they were bringing him in to do this. He had already healed many others, we're told, and so this is what they were expecting. But Christ doesn't do what they would expect. He actually says, "Man, thy sins be forgiven thee." And if we continue on, then we read in verse twenty-one, it says, "Then the scribes and the Pharisees." And he's obviously Christ is doing this for a very particular reason. He's making a point here with these particular people present, the Pharisees and, and, the, and the doctors of the law, these, these chief people of Israel sitting there. And in verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, 
who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. And he then turns to the sick of the palsy, and he says, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. So to prove the authority that God had given him to forgive sins, Christ now goes and he now turns to heal the man. And he tells the man to stand up. This man who's been carried around for, uh, for his whole life, essentially. And he now tells him to go and stand up, something he's never done before, and take up his bed and to go into his house. And here we see a, a very important principle that, that Christ is laying out is the principle that forgiveness of sins leads to the redemption of our bodies and not the other way around. So first, the forgiveness of sins was necessary. And that's what Christ essentially points out here before he deals with the infirmities of the man's body itself. So first, we need to be forgiven of our sins and we have to come and, and in repentance approach our father and approach the Lord Jesus Christ and seek to be forgiven as we turn to, to and, and choose to go a different way of life instead of serving the flesh. And then God willing, we'll have our bodies changed. And that's the ultimate thing that, that God is looking to do in us. He wants to have a host of redeemed ones who are no longer susceptible to the curse in Adam, to, to the tendencies of the flesh that we have, and are no longer cursed to return to the ground. That's not what God wants for us. That's not what God wants with his creation. And so he's creating a people who eventually are going to have their bodies healed. The ultimate physician will heal our bodies and we will have a body that's immortal. They'll no longer be susceptible to these weaknesses in the flesh that this man has. And so both of these aspects are true. First, we need the forgiveness of sins that brings us to Christ and teaches us the way to go and allows us uh, to, to come before the Father. And then God seeks to change our bodies and to have our bodies fashioned into glorious bodies like our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we keep reading in verses uh, 25 and 26, it says, and immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we've seen strange things today. And uh, you, you can only imagine the, 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 uh, the, uh, the response of the people here. This man, they see this man immediately responding to Christ, to Christ's command. And he does and he gets up and he does exactly what Christ says. And in response to that, he's picking up this bed, this bed that used to carry him around, this, this thing that he had no control over. Other people had to move him around using this bed. And now he actually has control over it. And now he's able to walk and he goes and he's able to follow and, and walk in the ways that, that Christ has told him to go. And he goes into his house. And this would have been an amazing scene for everyone to witness. And, and the joy that this man would have, would have, uh, um, would have felt at that time. Um, and the joy of his friends, because it tells us specifically that uh, someone had pointed this, this out to me recently that I found really helpful, is it actually says when Christ saw their faith, it wasn't just the faith of the man being let down. It was the faith of him and his friends. You see, it was a, it was a communal effort. It was, a, it, was a, it was something they were doing together, and they were seeking the salvation of Christ together. And so they were trying to get in this house to, get to, to, to see Christ, to, see, to seek salvation from him. And there was something that they did as a, as a group together, which is an important lesson for us as well. There's something that exactly that we are doing right now. Um, and what's interesting is we see a very uh, similar picture in the next set of verses regarding our introduction to uh, one of Christ's disciples, Matthew, or in this case named Levi. In, um, in verse 27 and 28, we had just have this um, uh, example here, kind of giving us a, a little bit description about um, about this man, uh, Levi or Matthew. It says, after these things, this is you know, following, uh, following these events, then Christ goes forth and he sees a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up and followed him. And uh, again, that was just like the, the verse, uh, verse two that we read, uh, that we sung in our hymn uh, just now. And uh, the publicans uh, basically just means that he was a tax collector. So uh, he was a tax collector for the Roman government. And uh, obviously the Romans had dominion over Israel. Um, and uh, these were commonly natives of the province in which they were stationed. And uh, they were um, 
and they're being brought in, into daily contact with all the different classes of the population, essentially. Um, so custom house officers, they would examine each bale of goods, they were, whether they're exported or imported, they would assess its value, and then they write, write out the ticket and they enforce the payment of the taxes. Now, typically it seems like they had a quota of taxes they would have to meet for the government, uh, but anything over that particular tax, they could essentially pocket for themselves. And so they were known for overcharging whenever they had opportunity for it. We're told in Luke chapter three and verse 13 about this practice. We're gonna consider that in just a moment. Uh, in some cases, even bringing false charges of smuggling in the hope of extorting money. And we're gonna see that a little bit later in, in Luke chapter 19. And in general, the Jews had a absolute disdain for this class of people. They were working for the Gentile oppressors. They were working for the enemy. And they were becoming wealthy in their mistreatment of their fellow brethren, of the Jews. And they're becoming wealthy and rich off of this. And so there was an absolute disdain of this class of people. And it was to this particular man, Matthew, Levi here, that Christ says, follow me. And it says he immediately does exactly as Christ asked him to do, just like the man with the palsy did. But in this case, what's interesting is there's a, there's a bit of a comparison or, or a contrast, if you will. It says specifically that he left all. So instead of the man with the palsy, Christ doesn't say, leave your bed and, and go walk. He says, actually, pick up your bed and go to your house. And, and we kind of consider the, the contrast of that example, where now he actually has, he's, he's been given the, the ability to, to lead himself forward and, and, and no longer be encumbered by the flesh to, to walk in the ways of Christ. In this case, Matthew's told to leave all, leave all that money, leave that, leave that, that the job that you have that, that set him up very well, leave all that behind. That is actually your encumbrance and you need to stand up and come and follow me now. And so he has a different thing. He, he, he has kind of a, a contrast to the man with the palsy in that way. And in fact, the language being used there of, of saying he left all is very similar if you were to uh, make a link back to verse 11 of the same chapter where uh, the four uh, disciples, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, it says that they left, they forsook all, and they followed him in like manner. So very similar instance uh, uh, of language there. And so he simply rise up. He rises up just like the, the lame man, it says. It says he rose up and he goes and he follows Christ as commanded. But we might ask the question, well, why did he do this? Did, did he recognize who Christ was? Like, just if anyone just came up to him and said, you know, just c come away and follow me, would he, would he typically do it? Um, it, it? And so as we ask that question, I think it's highly likely, it seems, that he had some previous knowledge about the coming of Christ, who Christ was, uh, and it, in fact, uh, potentially had, had some really helpful um, instruction from John the Baptist. And if we could I'd like to turn back to John, or sorry, to Luke chapter three, uh, to consider that. So in Luke chapter three, just a couple pages back, um, we have John the Baptist, Baptist baptizing, and we're told specifically in verses three to six, it says, and, um, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. This is one of the key themes of, of, the, uh, of the life of, um, of Matthew and his example here. The baptism of, the, uh, for the, for the, of repentance for the remission of sins. As, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying, In the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made shall be made straight, and all the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now, as your margin will tell you, this is directly fulfilling the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 40. Um, if you keep your hand in Luke chapter 3, I'm just going to turn back there really quickly. If you like, you can turn with me uh, back to Isaiah chapter 40. And uh, I'd like to get a little bit more context on that pat on that section that was just quoted and some of the language surrounding that when we look at p potential connections here to the calling of Matthew the publican the tax collector so in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 1 we read it says here comfort ye comfort ye my people saith your god speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished that her iniquity is pardoned 
for she hath received of Yahweh's hand double for all her sins. And then we have the quoted piece of text that we just read, that, that we just read. And then in verse five, it says, and the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken it. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? And this is the message. All flesh is grass and all the goodliness thereof as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of Yahweh bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So an interesting connection when you consider this, um, this passage in connection to Matthew is this idea of comfort being emphasized three times here in that first verse. Matthew was one of these publicans, and he resided in the city of Capernaum. And um, the, uh, if you do a word study, um, it points to the same Hebrew word for comfort, comfort that you find back in Isaiah chapter 40, basically the idea of Nahum, is closely linked to the Hebrew iteration of Capernaum, which is the village of comfort. So you have a connection there in the sense of, of this idea of comforting the people of Israel. And here, Matthew living and in, in dwelling in Capernaum, where Christ is now preaching and him, him being called out from this place. And another thing to point out is that there are four il, uh, environmental illusions being referred to. We can go and turn back to Luke chapter three at this point, if you like. Uh, there's four environmental illusions being referred to in this, um, in this passage in, in, um, that's quoted here in Luke chapter three. And it seems that they actually might correspond to four different manners of people who come to John in Luke chapter three. Uh, so we're told first that the valleys, the first environmental aspect that's being told is the valleys are exalted. So those things that are low are being brought up. And you could see of the people that come to Christ, you could look at this as being the common people, the lowly people. So that's in Luke chapter three in verse 10. If you wanted to make a note of that, it just says the people, the common people asked him saying, what shall we do then? And he then John the Baptist then gives uh, a response to them. And so these are the common people, the valleys. And then it says the next environmental example we have is the mountains and the hills. So those things that are raised up high, those things are going to be brought low. And you could liken that to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we find that in verses uh, seven to nine. Now, it doesn't specifically say the Pharisees and the Sadducees in this particular uh, gospel record. But all you have to do is, is look in Matthew chapter three for the parallel account. And we're told very specifically that this language in verses seven to nine is spoken to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those who were elevated up above the people. Um, and he's in here, the language is saying those who are on the mountains and the hills are going to be brought low. Next, the next environment mentioned or uh, um, aspect that's mentioned is the rough. It talks about the rough ways. So the rough are made smooth. And so in Luke chapter three and verse 14, we have the soldiers being mentioned. It says the soldiers likewise demanded of him saying, what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. That's how the rough are going to be made smooth. And then finally, we get to the crooked. So the crooked are made straight. And so what's the fourth group of people that come to Christ or come to uh, John the Baptist in this case and are being prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? But it's the publicans. Look at Luke uh, chapter three and verses 12 to 13. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? So how do the crooked become straight? And he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed to you. So that goes back to the point where it seems that they were taking more than they, than they should when they were doing taxes for themselves. And here he's saying, don't take any more than what you're supposed to take. And that is, in this example, the exhortation to the, to the crooked, the publicans who need to be made straight. And so I think it's highly likely that Matthew was prepared in this way and hearing these, these, these words and the exhortation of John the Baptist and preparing him, preparing his heart and his mind and even his way of life already, that he was willing to leave that money behind. He was ready to, 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 to go on and to, to not covet money anymore and to move on from that way of life. And so he was prepared when Christ came to, get, to rise up and leave all of that behind him and, and, and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's interesting is when all manners of people behold the Son of God, who perfectly reveals the glory of his Father, what is the real realization that's going to be made? What are we told that everyone's 
going to go, going to realize, and it's the fact that all flesh is as grass. All flesh withers, it fades, it dies. The field is actually completely leveled for all people in the end, no matter the class of person, high or low, crooked or the rough. Every single person ends up in the same place. The curse since Adam is the ultimate equalizer where all flesh ends up in the grave. However, John was preaching and preparing the people for the one who had come to redeem mankind from that inevitable end. And there's actually many examples of uh, these various classes of people who would end up coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you would see this, this change uh, take place for them. Uh, there, are, there are many examples of the common, lowly people joining themselves to Christ and being exalted. In fact, many of the disciples that we read about would fall into that category. Uh, you can think of Joseph of Arimathea, of Nicodemus, uh, and even of Paul, the Apostle Paul, who all turned to Christ after being Pharisees and those being in, in high places, and in fact were brought low and, and humbled. When you think of the aspect of soldiers, you can think of Cornelius, who's a great example of a rough soldier who was baptized into Christ and made smooth. And finally, we have uh, Matthew and Zacchaeus as preeminent examples here of, of, of the publicans, uh, the tax collectors, who, um, and we're going to look at Zacchaeus here in just a moment, um, as examples of the crooked being made straight in, the, in a wonderful fulfillment of, of the things mentioned back in Isaiah chapter 40 that, that John the Baptist was quoting and fulfilling. Uh, so we'll go, go ahead and uh, turn back to Luke chapter 5 in this moment, considering now perhaps the reasons why Matthew was prepared in his heart to leave all those things behind that, that, he, that, he had, um, uh, that he had been working in his life and, and the job that he had and, and, to, and, to, and to leave the money and everything and, and follow the Lord Jesus Christ because he saw salvation was here. Um, and what's interesting is this incident that we now see with Matthew uh, does uh, be begin many occasions where Pharisees and publicans will be contrasted throughout Christ's ministry. Um, in fact, if we were to... Um, uh, let's actually let's go ahead and read um, let's read Luke, like Luke chapter five verses twenty nine to thirty two um, before we uh, kind of look at some some other examples of this. So uh, verse twenty nine it says, um, after, "This is after he, he he hears the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets up and he follows him right away." And this is the response of what happens next. It says, "Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with him." But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against the disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And this is really, if you wanted to highlight it in your Bible, for me personally, I find this to be the key theme, the key principle that we are to take away from the life of Matthew. Verses 31 and 32. Those who recognize they are sick know that they need to go and see a physician. Those that recognize their nature, the nature that we have in Adam, that we are sinners, we know that we need to repent, and then we know that we need salvation. And this is in direct contrast to the Pharisees, who had no need for a physician. They didn't see themselves as being sick. They did not need a savior. They themselves found a way of twisting the law in such a way that they felt that they could actually keep it. And therefore, making God the debtor and they themselves the creditors, and therefore God was owing them eternal life instead of the other way around. And this is the key point. This is the key um, contrasting point of views that we're going to see going forward. And, and the Pharisees and, and, and the, um, those in power in the, in the Jewish, um, in the Jewish leaders, leadership uh, completely despised these lower class of people who were not as righteous as them. And what's interesting is if we uh, maybe turn to Luke chapter 15, if we could, we're just going to briefly touch on this. Obviously, we can't, we're not going to go into detail here, uh, but the entire context of the parables of the lost, which is in the entirety of Luke chapter 15, the entire basis of this parable is back in Luke chapter 5. It is, it is the calling of Matthew. So when you look at this, think about the calling of Matthew. This is what it's all about. And it's not about how to save lost people. In fact, this would be, these would be terrible examples of how to, how to save people who are lost. That is not at all what this parable is about. This parable is about revealing that the Pharisees themselves were viewing themselves 
as, as being righteous, and therefore God had no joy in them. And in fact, they should have been joyous. It was actually just simply revealing what was in the heart here. And there was something off in their heart where they couldn't have joy right now the way God would have joy in seeing someone repent. And in fact, that is what God wants. And, and, and there really was no helping them with, with that continued mindset. And we're told in verse two, very, very, uh, verses one and two of, of Luke chapter 15, that publicans and sinners uh, came, for, came close to, to hear the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with him, eateth with him. That is the exact same language of, of where this initially transpires when, when Matthew has Christ in his house and other publicans in there, and they lash out at Christ because of it. That, that's the seedbed of, of this type of language throughout the rest of the Gospels. It all starts with Matthew. And so what's interesting is as he gives these parables, you'll notice every single parable is basically just three different, um, three different ways of telling the exact same story. And, that, and that's all really it's for. He's just giving three different examples with the exact same principle at, at its core. And the, and, the core it, and the core principle is that of rejoicing, of being joyous, when, when salvation is found. Verse five, when he has found the sheep that was lost, he lays it on his shoulders and he's rejoicing. Verse six, what does he do? He, when he comes home, he calls together his friends. What did Matthew do when he came home? He goes on into his house. He has Christ there with him. And he calls together his friends and his neighbors. And they say, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. They had found salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're rejoicing because of it. And the Pharisees and the, and, the, and the leadership of the Jews did not share in that same joy. They didn't share in the same joy in, in, in seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, they found him to be uh, an enemy of theirs. Verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. That's the key. They were the 90 and 9. The Pharisees were the 90 and 9 just persons who didn't need a physician, who didn't need to repent, because according to the law, their interpretation of it and their ability to keep it, they were not sinners like these other people that they were despising. The second parable has the exact same principle. Verse 9, it's about joy. Verse 10, it's about joy. It says, when she found the coin in verse 9, what does she do? She calls her friends and her neighbors together. It's just what Matthew did. And then what do they do? Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which was lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. And they get together and they would have a feast together and there would be joyous together in, in what they had found. And then finally, what about the parable of the two sons? You have the one son who goes off, lives riotous living, and his response is the spot response that God wants. In verse 18, he says, I will arise. That's the language that we saw from the man with the palsy. That's the language of Matthew. I will arise and walk in a new way of life. I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to go back and I'm going to say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called their, thy son. That is a spirit that God can work with and that Christ can work with. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And again, the language says, and he arose and he came to his father. And his father saw him a great way off and he was looking for him he was looking for him to come and that's what god and that's what christ is doing for us when we fall short they're looking for us to come back when we when we find ourselves erring and straying and he can't wait wait to embrace us and he confesses before his father in verse 21 that i've sinned against heaven in thy sight i'm not worthy to be called a son anymore but look at the father's response the father's response is to make a feast to call all the friends and all the neighbors together just like matthew did and to have a feast. Verse 23, let us eat and be merry. Verse 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's right back to the first parable. It's, it's literally the same thing over and over again. And they began to be merry. There, there, there was joy in the house because salvation had come for his son who was dead. But what's the problem is there's another son in that house, right? Is the other son who ends up being angry when he sees the feast. He sees the feast for the this sinner? Why is there a feast for the sinner over here? And what was in his heart comes out and is revealed. And look in verse, uh, verse 28. It says, um, he was angry and he would not go in. 
He didn't want to go into that house, and these Pharisees did not want to go in that house where these sinners were. Therefore, his father comes out to him and entreats him. And he says to him in verse 29, Lo, these many, or sorry, um, this is the son saying to his father. He says to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee. And here's the key thing to underline. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Well, that sounds like a just person that needs no repentance. Someone who's not committed sin. I've never transgressed at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry or have joy with my friends. You see, the, the son could have been sharing in the joy of the repentant brother, but he chose not to. He despised the acts of the brother and felt really he should have been having the feast. The feast should have been for him. And he goes on and saying, but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living and the harlots, thou hast killed him for a fatted calf. And then he, and then the, the principle of, of verse 30 uh, of being rejoicing and being merry and glad again pops up in verse 32. It was meet as, as the father responds to him that we should make merry and be glad. It was right for us to be joyous. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. This entire section of, of these three parables that are telling the same story is all built on the principles back in Matthew, uh, back regarding the, the calling of Matthew back in Luke chapter 5. Our, the, the response in our hearts when we, when we recognize salvation has come to us and we are joyous and we, and we share in that together. And we want to call and, 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 and let all of our friends know. Um, and, and it was the, the Pharisees who absolutely despised this. Uh, in Luke chapter 14, one chapter earlier, we're not going to go there, um, but the Lord Jesus Christ is eating in the house of a Pharisee. And he gives various parables all tied to the idea of feasting and um, and being called to feast and things like that. And he teaches he teaches the Pharisees about the need to be humble, uh, to to not want the chief rooms in the feast. You see, the Pharisees like to feast, uh, and they like to be in the chiefest rooms and be seen feasting. But they didn't want to be seen feasting with people like Matthew. Those are the people that again were were below them, were despised. But they needed to be brought low, and that's what Christ is trying to teach them in Luke chapter 14 with various parables. And he also talks about the the need to include the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind and them being invited to the feast as well. You see, the Pharisees wanted to exclude those people. And Christ is saying, no, all these people are seeking to be brought in, all classes of people. God is trying to bring them in to this wonderful hope. Uh, in Luke chapter 18, we have the example of the publican and the sinner. Again, this is based on um, going back to the uh, original um, controversy regarding Matthew and, and inviting people into his house. And you see the same theme pop up again in verse 9. Uh, he says, uh, Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Again, that's the Pharisees and these people. And they despised others. That's the mentality that they had. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector like Matthew, a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee. I'm not as these other men are. And what's the first thing that comes to his mind? Extortioners. Like this man I see here right next to me. This, this tax collector. These unjust, these adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The focus there on his own works and the reward that is due him. Simply, simply put. But the response of the publican in verse 13, the publican stands afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what's necessary for all of us, for Matthew, for the man with the palsy, for all of us, even for the Pharisees, was to recognize our state and to recognize that we need a physician, that we need salvation, and it can only be provided through our Lord Jesus Christ, um, by our Father providing him. And then finally, you get to Luke chapter 19. And in Luke chapter 19, we find the account of Zacchaeus. And it's almost like uh, Matthew and Zacchaeus be become these bookends of this particular theme, particularly throughout the book, book of Luke. Um, so in Luke chapter 5, you have Matthew. And then Luke chapter 19, you have Zacchaeus. And in between, you have all these accounts of the Pharisees and publicans being contrasted and Christ dealing with this particular issue, which starts with Matthew. And now we're going to see in Zacchaeus uh, some really interesting principles that, that, again, are really highlighted for us. So he now goes to Jericho in verse 1 in Luke chapter 19. 
And there was a man named Zacchaeus, which his name means pure, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. So this man was in Jericho, the chief. He was the top publican, the top tax collector, and he was very, very wealthy. He had been doing well with the job that he had. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was of little stature. That sounds kind of similar to what happened with the man of the palsy leading into the account with Matthew. He was trying to get in there and, and, and to see Christ, but he couldn't. And he was small in stature. He was, he was literally a little man. And so what does he do? He goes up to a higher place so he can try and get down, just like the man sick with the palsy. And, and it says he, uh, in verse 4, he ran before and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him. He did exactly as the Lord Jesus Christ said immediately, just like the other examples that we saw with the man of, sick of the palsy and Matthew. And how did he receive him? Here's the key word again. Joyfully. He received him with joy. And when they saw it, who saw it? The same people who have been complaining about the publicans and the sinners meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. And how could you associate with those people? When they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him full full, fourfold. It seems like he's learned the same principles of the things that John the Baptist was teaching as well. He was already looking to change his way of life and to turning from the way of life he was before. So he was ready when the Lord Jesus Christ came to completely devote himself to him. And he wanted to have him come into his house and immediately prepares his house to have him in there. And he receives him with absolute joy. And Jesus said unto him in verse 9, and this is why there's joy. This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. See, Zacchaeus was the other lost sheep as well, mentioned in Matthew, along with all of us. All those who recognize that we need salvation, that salvation has come into our house, those are, those are the ones who Christ can help. The physician can help and save and to, and to heal. So um, if we can turn back to Luke chapter 5, we'll start to wrap up our thoughts here a little bit. And uh, in Luke chapter 5 and verse 33, we'll read um, verses 33 to 35 really quickly. It says, they say unto him, you know, why did the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but your disciples eat and drink. And he said unto them, can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast? while the bridegroom is with them. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And so these other, these other questions come up, and, and Christ likens the situation to a wedding. And he being the bridegroom and with his bride, um, and there, there there's great joy in that, in that type of feast. We've experienced various weddings over the years, and it's always a joyous occasion, right? Um, and this this uh, example he's, he's giving here in this parable he's giving uh, directly corresponds to Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9, where Christ, the bridegroom, and the saints, his bride, are finally joined together as one. The bride is arrayed in white, which represents the righteousness of the saints. And this is a multitude of sinners, those who recognized that they were sinners and wanted to repent and change from their ways. It was those who have been redeemed and healed by the phys physician and now declared righteous by the sacrifice of Christ and declared righteous by God. Not by their own works, but by God. They can now enjoy the marriage feast with joy as they will no longer succumb to the weakness in the flesh and will perfectly reveal the character of God on the earth. And the events surrounding the calling of Matthew provide all of these lessons for us. The key theme being the necessity to recognize that all of mankind are lost and in need of salvation, every single one of us. In Adam, all are under the same curse and therefore all end up in the grave because of sin. When we recognize this very fact, we are then in the position of the man with palsy, in the position of Matthew, in the position of Zacchaeus. We then know that we need a physician to be made whole and therefore we heed the prescribed way into salvation 
that's set forth by the Lord Jesus Christ, the prescription that, that our Heavenly Father has graciously provided for us and prepared for us, that we might ultimately be a part, be a part of fulfilling his purpose with the earth. And Christ himself recognized that he also shared in the same need. By his very nature, in being a son of Adam, he had the same inclinations towards sin as we do. And he ended up in the grave just like we do as well, because he was under that same curse in Adam. And yet we know that he never committed sin. He never succumbed to it. As each day he put the death, the lusts, and the, uh, the affections of the flesh. He did this out of love for his father and for all those who would be redeemed by his sacrifice. And it's interesting if we just uh, turn back one page to Luke chapter 4, that Christ actually prophesies that the people will actually tell him a particular thing regarding uh, him being the physician. And he, he calls himself the physician uh, in, in Luke chapter 5, and he actually does it again back in Luke chapter 4. He says in verse, uh, in verse uh, 23, and, and this is where they're astounded about the, as, as he's reading from the word of God and, 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 what's, and, and saying he's, he's fulfilling various scripture right now in their ears. And in verse 23, and, and they're asking, whose son is this? Is, you know, is this not Joseph's son? In verse 23, he says unto them, you will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. So there's going to be a taunt, and he prophesies, he knows this is going to come from his own people, and they're going to say to him, you're the physician, heal yourself. Go ahead, do it. And this is exactly what they did. Luke chapter 23, if you want to do a cross-reference there, Luke chapter 23 and verses 35 to 37 is where this prophecy that Christ gives comes to pass. And this is how they Say to him, physician, heal thyself. Luke chapter 23 and verse 35. Um, actually, let's look at the verse 34 for context here. It says, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, he saved others. He was a physician to others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Save yourself, physician. Verse 36, And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. So what Christ said would come to pass did. And they told the physician, Go on and heal, heal yourself right now. If you really are the physician, you've healed other people, why can't you save yourself? Well, it was only because he had to remain on the cross. Only by remaining on the cross would the head of the serpent be crushed and sin and death could be abolished so that true healing, the changing of our bodies, could be accomplished. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, no longer struggling against his own flesh and, and now immortal, God is calling all who hear, all those people who recognize that they're sinners, that they recognize the weakness they have, that we have in the flesh, the need for a physician, um, God is calling all those who are going to follow him by faith and partake of the same nature. And so, brothers and sisters, we now have before us these emblems as a memorial, as a remembrance of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we, and we share in this solemn meal together right now in remembrance of him. And, 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 uh, and, and yet we can still do it in joy, even though it's a, we share it as a solemn meal thinking about his death. Yet we, we have joy in knowing that. Salvation has come into our houses. We're all in our houses right now, yet we're together. We are together. And joy has come into our house. And so we're looking ahead to the things that are before us, the joy of that marriage supper that we're looking to partake in. And that, that particular supper is being preserved by God's grace and God's mercy for all those who recognize their need to be made whole by the physician.